Welcome to Politics Welcome Done to Right. Politics. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Good morning, Houston. Good morning, Houston. How are how's everybody doing? I trust all's doing fine. Anyhow, folks, if you're driving, thank you for tuning in to KPFT 90.1 FM, Politics Done Right. Look, folks, we have a great show for you. As usual, we are here to do what again? Serve. We're here to serve. Anyhow, let's let's throw it back to the control room to see how our brothers are doing in that room. How is it going out there, Howard and Mr. Van Beber? Well, brother number two is doing just fine. How's brother number one this morning? Brother number one is doing good, well-rested. I decided to take another hour in the morning to sleep. <laughs> So better rest. And the question today is, why is war used for economic stimulation? With the, infl- with the inflation that we've been having, are these profiteers, are they war profiteers that are driving inflation with, uh, with their uh, profit taking? Didn't you ask that yesterday? Something like that, but, you know, I I try to read a little more into it each time. So, you know, this inflation and, uh, you know, war profiteering look a lot the same to me. Oh, variations on a theme. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I was just, I just don't want to get confused about yesterday's question and today's question. And I'm well, you know, <laughs> I, I, lo- I love, I love the question. I love the question. So you got an answer for that, uh, Howard? Well, we should throw it to the vast and unpaid research department at 713-526-5738, extension 2, and let them weigh in on it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. We have a we have a great show, though, folks. Uh, you know, Van Bever always wakes us up in the morning with a prescient thought. Anyhow, title of the show today is Lindsey Graham's Path to Sycophancy. Uh, that's one piece that I put together with some old stuff and some new stuff. Put some two t- types of videos together there. And then, of course, we have the Ohioans are showing. They are showing what people power is all about using the ballot. We're going to talk about that. And I think that story, if we get to that story, Howard, you're going to like it because the soapbox that you're always on, that's what and necessarily so, let me just say, necessarily so. That's what we're going to talk about. And, of course, we're going to start the program with a great a great supporter of our show, member of the PDR Posse, is going to tell us his story. Paul Fleming's uh, multiple sclerosis ordeal. We're going to start the show with that. But before we get started, folks, anyhow, let's go ahead and say, please remember there are several ways that you can reach us here at KPFT 90.1 FM. Of course, if you're in the dials, you just go to 90.1 on your dial. If you're in the car, wherever you are, and we come flying through the air to your ears. However, you can also download the TuneIn app and go to your Android store or your Apple store, and you're able to listen to us after you find KPFT on the TuneIn app. You can stream us right there on your telephone. You can stream us directly from our website, kpft.org kpft.org and just click on listen and you can listen to the show and of course you can watch the show live facebook.com slash kpft houston facebook.com slash kpft houston or on youtube by going to politics done right.tv politics done right.tv look folks this is your show and when it this is one show when we say it's your show that is exactly what we mean it is your show Not only is it your show, if there are reasons that you think I need to be on in a segment with you, Egberto, because I have something prescient to say, please note that you can do that as well. Just like uh, I I listened to some of the commentary from uh, uh, our PDR Posse member, Paul Fleming, over the last few days. And I'm like, you know, we need to discuss this issue again. Healthcare, you know that it's it should be all our pet peeves, so we're going to discuss that. By the way, folks, remember this is a call-in show as well, 713-526-5738, extension number 2, 713-526-5738, extension number 2. All the, all the topics that we're talking about on every program, we have it in our newsletter that shoots out at 5 every morning. You can go to politicsdoneright.com slash newsletter politicsandright.com slash newsletter. 
If we don't get to all of the topics here, you can always figure it up there because we're likely not going to do it for a few more days or whatever. You can drop me an email, complain, or tell me you like what we're saying or tell me you hate what we're saying. Go to kpft at politicsdoneright.com. All of this is in the newsletter as far as how you can reach us. Anyhow, folks, without any further ado, let's go ahead and listen to our good friend, Paul Fleming. And then after, I think it's about a 21 or 22 minute interview. And then we'll continue with the program and take all the call-ins we can get. Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. Today, I am honored to speak to one of the members of our PDR posse, Paul Fleming. Paul has a story to tell. Paul has a history to tell about health care and much more. Paul, thank you so kindly for being a part of the PDR Posse, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to hear your story. Well, thank you for being the kind person that you are, uh, you know, with a blessing of a demeanor that carries you through all trials and tribulations. I just feel like that all of us are put through a test to have a testimony to tell. And I'm proud to be able to still tell my story because some people with my disease are gone and don't have a story to tell. It's just people that they've left behind have their story. So Paul, let, let's, go, let's go from the beginning. You're, you're, I mean, we've all, we've all been a part of the healthcare system, but in your case, something occurred to you that uh, made it much more difficult to navigate. Why don't you tell us the genesis, the beginning of, of, of what you went through? Well, you know, at 37, I was really getting into the prime of my career. Uh, I was a high ranking official with a major restaurant chain. And uh, I could actually see uh, the finish line of the type of future that I wanted. And, uh, you know, traveling in out of town, trying to manage family life. Um, you know, it was difficult to put on my wife of just now 33 years. So, um, all the kudos go to her. Um, but, you know, coming home one weekend, trying to help out with the laundry and be the man that, you know, I've chosen to be, I'm doing laundry, uh, one Saturday morning. Uh, and then it happened. I turned the corner and my left side just shut off. Like someone just turned off a light switch. My breathing pattern changed and I found myself on the floor looking up at the four year lights, like, Lord, what is going on? And, uh, and then I started with my toes trying to get it to move. And I swear to you, it, it seemed like it, it was an hour, but it probably was no more than three to five minutes um, of me regaining the use of my leg, my toes first, then my leg, then my hands, then my arm. And so I slowly stood up and did 10 jumping jacks, sprang up both flights of stairs, looked down and said, Lord, I need to schedule a doctor's appointment. Nothing happened the rest of the day. And I didn't say anything to anybody in, in the house about it. Uh, the very next day, doing the exact same thing, it happened again. But this time when I looked up, my youngest son was looking down at me. And I guess he could see the distress on my face because he started screaming for his mother when he saw me struggling to try to get up off the floor. And when he started screaming, that just put me in a panic to hurry up and get off the floor. And by the time my wife made it out of the bedroom, I was halfway up the stairs. I tried to deny what was happening, but my youngest son wouldn't let me off the hook. So I had to admit that something was wrong with dad, but I will be going to the hospital to find out what's going on. So. Being the person that he is, he had to examine his father for 30 minutes and I let him in the bedroom <laughs> to see me. <laughs> and, and, and as a child would do, he slowly just left the room, you know. Uh, and it took me three doctors. I had to fire three doctors before getting to the right one. One doctor told me I just needed to lose weight. Well, had he looked at the chart, I had just lost 40 pounds. So I'm like, OK, you're out. Went to a neurologist. He just did it as a, uh, I guess, the first, like you said, a consultation. When you just sit down, he just talk about it. But he didn't talk about ordering any tests or anything. I'm like, did you not hear what I said to you, sir? I lost the total use of my left side. 
I was literally paralyzed on the floor. Oh, yeah. You know, well, you know, we'll we'll schedule another appointment and we'll get into all of that. And when I wanted to get into the specifics of what he was planning on doing, he would just ignore me. And then I went to another doctor that just said he just didn't, you know, he couldn't help me. Something in my heart just told me to ask for the youngest doctor in the practice. This young doctor, not only did he order every test of us under the sun, the most amazing part is that he sent the information out of his practice. And, you know, to the Mayo Clinic, to Emory here in Atlanta, and to the Shepherd Center here in Atlanta. And the Shepherd Center here in Atlanta uh, asked that he do a spinal tap. And it was just fortunate enough that the hospital nearby just installed the type of machine that they could just lay me on there and it was laser guided. So I wouldn't feel any pain because everybody gave me a nightmare story about going to the doctor's office. He's got a long needle and it's going to hurt. And I was like, geez, I don't know if I wanted to do that. But, you know, I did it because I needed to. And but it still took me three months to get an appointment with a specialist uh, in the city. So let me, let me stop you right there, because I, I, want, sure. I want folks to see one thing right here. You had good health insurance with your company then, correct? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. As a matter I, of fact. I shared insurance with my wife's job, too. So I was double covered. We were double covered each way, which was really, you know, a neat thing to do. This is important for our audience to realize because you were double covered with private insurance and still yes. to be a specialist, you had to wait three months. We always yes. talk about the difference between our system and the Canadian system or the British system is that your times you have to wait and wait and wait. Well, here right. you go with a condition that at one point left you paralyzed on the left side. And here in America, with two very good private healthcare insurance policies, you still had to wait yep. three months. Had to wait three months without any medication. I, want the, I wanted our audience, uh, Paul, to, to hear that because of the yes. fallacy you get from the right that somehow miraculously our right. private system is great. Right. Please continue, my Just friend. Just to make a normal appointment, you at least have to wait almost a month in some occasions. Right. You know, so it happens in America just like it probably would anywhere else. So the myth, again, that some people in politics want to spread about, you know, other country's healthcare system is just totally false. I mean, you can be braggadocious about something, but make sure that it's factual, you know, because not having the wrong information can have you die. You know, in right. my case, having the wrong information, had I believed the first doctor who said I just needed to lose weight, I could have just totally lost it in the use of my left side and not ever got it back. Because and in you between could have been driving, you could have been right. driving, not knowing Absolutely. that her as you Absolutely. were driving. Absolutely. A part yeah. of my job is that I covered the Southeast from North Carolina to Texas. Um, and so each city that I get come into, I have to drive to the destinations. So it could have happened, you know, it could have happened that way. And and thank goodness that it didn't. Um, you know. And I just went into a panic. Well, I'll let you carry on with it because I know we can't be all day with this interview. Oh, no, no, but, but what, what I want to do is get now. So we got to the position where uh, you finally got your spinal tap, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. now they're, they, they're going to discover what's wrong with you. Right. So I had the spinal tap and he since the Emory, I mean, since the Shepherd Center responded first, he sent the information back. And the proteins in my spine indicated that I had multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. and, and so, again, it took three months to get to my specialist. But in between time, I started having seizures. I didn't know what was going on again. So I scheduled another doctor's appointment. But just luckily, the very next week I had an appointment and me being, you know, a man, I guess, being real ignorant. I didn't go to the emergency room. I just said, I got a doctor's appointment. I'm going to be OK. You know, when you, when you feel young and healthy, you know, you just it right. gives you the wrong thoughts about things that you just don't know about. And right. fortunately enough for me, I made it to that next appointment and he had to just literally sit me in the hallway while he see other patients until it happened again. And when it happened, he came up and he immediately knew what it was. And so since like the first month, since I took the first, when I took the first dosage of that medication, I never had another seizure. Okay. So, so it's the quick, so, uh, it's the quick reaction by him, and the quickness of the appointment. I think that really prevented other things from happening to me. 
Now, uh, so how has it been now that you've discovered you've had multiple sclerosis at 37? Um, can I ask you how old you are now or? I'm 56. I'll be 57 this year. So that's almost 20 years ago that you found out you had multiple sclerosis. Yes, 2004. How, how, 2004. How has mm -hmm. the pathway with the healthcare system and uh, medicine, the, the pharmaceutical system been for you? Okay. In the, in the very beginning, because, um, because I had, uh, because I had double coverage through my wife and myself. Uh, but, it, but I was really afraid to continue with my job, you know, being on airplanes and driving vehicles. So I resigned. Um, and so I lost part of that coverage. And then something happened on my wife's job. And so we had no coverage from one time, but then I got another job, you know, in town because I needed to work and I wanted to work. Uh, and I got, I found another job within like two weeks. So it was no big deal. And I had coverage again. And then that's when the owl browsing raising effect took place. Coming into the very next year, the cost of my medication, the first 30 day supply of my medication cost $15,000. And because I made so much money so fast as a young man, and I think my doctor, and not, I, I really believe my doctor told me about other um, philanthropists out there, I can't say that word correctly, but that, that provide help for people uh, with medical problems and those other organizations out there. I sort of glossed over it because I had the money. It's like, ah, you know, because I really didn't know because I was covered already. Ah, it ain't going to cost me that much, you know. But when it became $15,000, I'm like, whoa. But I had the money, so I just paid it. And I, I just paid, paid it. And then after the first for that, You paid that one month for that one month. January of each year was $15,000, almost $16,000. And I and dropped you paid it. it out of pocket. I paid it out of pocket. And, and then, um, then reimburse. No, of course not. No, that's just, that's just money gone. And then after that though, then it gradually, cause you're on a scale to, to pay out your deduction, but the first payment did that, but the payment still was $600 a month after thereafter for a 30 day supply each month, $600. Eventually it slid all the way down to like $250, $300 by December. But the very next January, you're back at $15,000 again. It started that process all over again. So I guess the first four or five years I did that. And it drained you. My wife, my wife being a realtor, uh, which in all of her jobs, bless her, she just had it as a hobby and I didn't care. Everything she wanted me to, wanted to do, I just, okay, I encouraged it. You know, she has a, uh, she's a real estate broker. She sells life and health insurance. Uh, she did reverse mortgages. Uh, anything she thought she wanted to do. So she owns about four or five Georgia state licenses. And she's like, honey, we're going to have to sell our home. And I, as if I wasn't depressed enough uh, that we had to move out of our home into an apartment, which my kid never experienced. You know, a parent always think the worst because, you know, you always want the next generation to have more than what you had. Mm -hmm. And so we looked around at several apartments. My kids were so excited. It was the total opposite of how we were feeling in apartments for about four years until they kept raising uh, the amount to live in there. When it got just over a thousand dollars, like, whoa, 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 we can be back in a home again. And so my wife being a magician that she is, we found our way back. Uh, but then eventually I had to leave that job because I had a relapse. And my supervisor, you know, all my employees, I told, you know, what my challenges were. But when my supervisor came in, she was being so rude that, you know, she almost fired all the my the, my coworkers. I call them coworkers, even though I was the boss because I never had the boss anymore. I trained you properly on the way you go. And as you continue to train and explain, 
and then they would just did the job. So I just would never allow them to tell friends or family that I'm the boss. This is my coworker. I say in your private time, you can say that, but I'm not your boss. People that I have to manage, yes, I'm your boss. But the people that come in and do the job, we're just coworkers. That's how I view the workplace. And that's why even today, if I go around town and just happen to run into a person, they want to know where I'm working at because they would leave their job to come work for me. Because I will let you be who you are, you know, knowing the goals we have to accomplish. Once we accomplish, relax, go take a smoke break. I don't care, you know, but when it's time to go to work, we all come together as a group and make things happen. Yeah, man. And, now, so you you went ahead with all, uh, you, you got to move back into your home, but you had to sell your house because of medical conditions and you've given the, the big format pretty much 60, 70 thousand dollars or more than that easily over a hundred thousand yeah. dollars worth He's, yeah one That's more like that. That. but still but still after getting this medication they weren't guaranteeing you anything you still had a relapse after being on this yeah. medication i still had a relapse over the now 20 years because you say i'm like wow it really is that long uh, i've probably been on eight different medications at one time i was taking 18 pills a day Wow. Wow. And and to the point to where it was it was causing me heart issues like it would get extremely hot. I would get extremely hot and my breathing pattern would change and I could feel my heartbeat slowing down so much. So and it usually happen. I'm by myself in the house, but I don't know what came over me to take all my clothes off. And I hate to say that in the interview, but I had to take my clothes off. And within like one minute. It was like nothing ever happened. And right. up until um, it happened at a MS event, because I would take different family members around so they would understand what happening to me around town. I would take them to an MS event. And it just so happened my oldest brother and my mother was with me when it happened again. And the man speaking was one of my doctor's uh, interns. And it happened there. And I, I thought I really thought I was just leaving right there. And I apologized to my mom and my brother, everybody in the room. I could hear them crying as I'm slowly fading away. And with my last breath, I, t I told the doctor to take my shirt off. And he was like, your shirt and my last nod. Well, that's all I had left because I could hear him saying 62 beats a minute, 43 beats a minute, all the way down to like 15, yeah, 15 beats a minute, you know, cause he had already yelled out the call in ambulance. Right. And, um, and sure enough, took my shirt off and I snapped back to it and I'm looking around everybody's crying. I'm like, what's wrong? And in my mind, that's when my mom really started bawling. And, but the doctor, the, the ambulance people came in and checked me out. Like, Oh, he's fine. He goes, do well, do you want to go with him? No, nah, I'll be okay. I'll just, they let me do an emergency appointment with them since, one of the doctors that I go to saw it. And so then they just start running other tests on me uh, to help me find out. And then I went to the top cardiologist in the state. Nobody could figure it out. And then so I just re-examined it. I re-examined all the medication I was taking and it was some conflicts. So I just gradually on my own slowly took myself off of medications. To this day, now I only take my MS medication uh, my look, neurological pills. Cause I have some every now and then some reactions, some gabapentin and that's right. it in my vitamins. That's it. And now, I've never had a as, problem again. Now. So uh, as far as how you're dealing now with the medical system, uh, before, before the affordable care act, it, were you able to get insurance or was that, uh, that preexisting condition? An issue? Well, I always knew that I could retire with this disease. And so with that last job, um, I just I just applied and was approved the very first time. And people still struggle today having MS of being not approved. And I don't understand why. Or for um, um, Social Security disability. Social Security. Yeah, I'm on SSI. And um, but still, even being on SSI, I had to reach out to these uh, organizations that will help 
pay my medical costs because I would have to literally sell my house. I probably, we probably, well, my wife really does have a really good job now and she's still doing real estate. So we probably would be okay, but it would be really difficult on her. Something that I wouldn't want her to go through because I told her and, you know, I told her if it gets really, really bad, I would leave you because I wouldn't want you to go through suffering to have two, three, four jobs, which she already does basically part time on her own anyway. Um, But I wouldn't want her to have to worry about me in that way. You know, I just love her too much. And I guess she loves me too much, too. Some of you fool, you should shut up. Don't say that to me. Don't say that to me. I'm going to I'm going to do whatever it takes for you is what she told me. Paul, I tell you something, and that that is what we fight about, right? Hell, yeah. that you had a bad hand. We all get a hand in what life has to offer us, right? And that you got yeah. a bad hand and that your personal economy should reflect your bad hand, that you had no, no way of choosing. Uh, that is what health care for all, ensuring that we are all our brother's keepers, ensuring that society is there to support us all. That's what it takes. Right. I've sent you being able to get from uh, support from uh, other sources. Nobody should have to be hunting for support to stay alive. If you come, if you work in a in a big corporation that is on the stock market, like a food chain that I was involved in, um, then you're you're paying into the system. And I try to explain to people like this that, that talk about health care. I said, in business, especially a restaurant chain, you always have one or more stores that suffers to make a profit, but you always have a few money makers to cover their losses. And so this is how you keep that other store afloat until you either do the proper marketing or hire the right people to increase sales. And sometimes the restaurant is just in the wrong place. And, you know, fortunately enough for me, I had the type of restaurant education to understand that, you know, because I basically started from the ground up in the business. And even after I left being sick, I was still offered to be co-owners of the business, but I was just too afraid of a relapse. And I didn't want to, if I couldn't feel like I could contribute a hundred percent, I just didn't want to do it. You know, but I still could have been a, a very wealthy person even after I got sick. But I didn't want to lie to anyone like everything is OK when I really felt like deep in my heart that it wasn't. So you know, and I'm that's just fortunate that the medication works. And that is honesty. And you know what? We need a hell of a lot more of that, Paul. So, Paul, um, we're coming close to the end. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about is to let people understand. I mean, the amount of tribulations one can go through, you are able to navigate. Uh, between your private insurance company and getting uh, those those companies that give offers, but uh, when when some people hear that you had to pay fifteen thousand uh, dollars for your uh, once a year for your drugs, as and then after six hundred dollars a month, that should mm-hmm. give everybody mm-hmm. pause for something that they should know they can have in a good healthcare system. It would be provided in a good healthcare system. The stresses yep. that you have to go through. For healthcare, uh, many people, uh, there's no reason for us to live this way. But you know, I, I hope Absolutely. your story, along with the stories of others, uh, continue to make a difference because that is how we're going to change people's mind. Paul Fleming, thank you so kindly for having been a politics done right. Thank you for having me, brother. I really appreciate you. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, you know, I really think one of the, uh, let me get a a bit on my soapbox here because, uh, you know, in talking to Paul and talking to others, it it, it irks me. Having a wife who has lupus, a chronic disease that lasts forever, and having a daughter who's had two strokes, uh, uh, both of them while in medical school, and having her back home recovering and as she's doing this, continuing to pursue what she wants to do. As you see people who are productive, who are doing things, to watch a healthcare system 
that is ultimately evil. And folks, I know there are a lot of people that are listening to me. They're driving in their cars right now. And, uh, and, and to them, things are fine. You pay your deductible, you, you have some sort of a managed care or whatever, and you think it's okay. You think it's okay. The, the issue is most people, they don't get the, uh, the disaster that occurred to Brother Paul Fleming, who we just heard. You don't get the two strokes that my daughter get, got. You don't get the lupus that my wife has. But there, there's a large enough percentage of Americans, of people, who get these things that it is a severe burden on their lives, things that they are not even, that they didn't do unto themselves. But it happens to them. A certain percentage of our population that is going to happen to. And you don't know if it's going to be you now. You don't know if it's going to be you in the future. But there's one thing you do know. That if one of these bad things happen to you, your private insurance companies, their job, the duty of the executives who run these corporations, these healthcare corporations, they're going to do their jobs. And their jobs is, their job is to make a profit for the shareholders of that private insurance company. That, that executive is not doing anything wrong. That person that is selling that insurance policy is not doing anything wrong. In America, it is a legitimate business. It's, a, it's an evil business, but it's a legitimate business. And when you don't, when you don't look when you look at things at as just how you are doing right now, you, you're, you can afford your premiums for your health care. And when you go in to see the doctor every month or whatever, it's covered, etc. For normal things, it's great. But then, but then, you are the one who may have an MS diagnosis like Paul had, where it started out, you know, he gets his first diagnosis and the first time he has to pay up for the drugs that's going to help him with his disease, it's $15,000. As, as he mentioned, he was in the top, very top high percent of earners in this country. He just wrote the check for $15,000 and $600 a month for that one medication or those medications that he needed for his MS, right? But I want you to ask about all your friends, your families that you know of. Who could write a $15,000 check to stay alive with a mess? Or all the other multiple diseases that there are out there? Do you know the amount? And, and who went under these conditions after being diagnosed with something? How much more stress is there on the body that you have to somehow find a way? How am I going to pay this? As in, in Paul's case, for some time. After going through thousands of dollars, having to sell a house, recovering, and always having that fear in the back of your head, always having that fear in the back of your head that things may go south again, and the recovery you've had financially is gone. Paul is listening on, I can see him on the chat, and he says, I think the next topic needs to be the psychological effect this has on one and as and for those of you who know uh psychological effects are real both in healthcare and otherwise you know so i am when i hear paul's story and 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 by the way folks i have my own with my daughter my own with my wife as well as i know there are hundreds of thousands of people millions of people out there that have that story that isn't aired because we decide to centralize on a particular healthcare system that hurts so many of us. Um, look, there are options. There are options. And they're not, it's not just options that we have, folks. It's in your control. What I told uh, Paul when I asked him to do the interview is I said, you know, Paul, we have a big task ahead of us. We have to get true universal health care for all. Health care for all. We have to do this for our society to survive. Because 
we don't we need to stop the suffering and silence that millions of Americans are going through. And millions of Americans are going through suffering and silence. I can't tell you the amount of emails, the amount of of notions that I get uh, from from folks who are going through issues. Like I said, if you have a country of 330 million people and 20 or 30 million in any given year are going through are going through dire straits with healthcare. That means there are 300 million people that are not yet seeing what can happen to them. And that's why companies like private health insurance and all of that can get a, get away with the things that they do. Because the critical mass of people who are being immediately harmed aren't immediately realized, even though it is something that is likely to touch all of us. So in my ranting monologue here there's one thing that i'd like to tell absolutely everybody here and that is we need to do better and while you may be doing fine right now with private health insurance i can tell you from lived experiences and from the lived experiences of many that it, it there's a good there's a there's a bigger chance than not that at some time, healthcare will affect your personal economy, your fiscal well-being. And why always do we cede our fiscal well-being to the very minute few who control the purse strings in this country? It is time for a change. And as my brother Howard in the studio would say, only you can do that. With your vote. Before I go to the next subject, I'd like to say, folks, give us a call 713 526 5738. Again, that number is 713 526 5738. Extension number two, we are taking calls. Your thoughts, uh, your thoughts, my dear friend in the studio, Senor Howard. Oh, no thoughts right now. I'm just sitting here thinking that man went through hell. And imagine yes. if. It happened to someone less uh, economically able. I mean, they would die. Yes. That would, be, that would be it. This man, I mean, I was, I feel so bad for him. You know, really, it's awful. And MS, there's nothing you can do about that. Medication will take care of it for a while. But it's just a, it's just an awful thing. I, I knew a lady who had that and it was terrible. Mm-hmm. Jack, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I always think, you know, a single payer would, would really solve a lot of these problems. You know, I think, I think getting, the, uh, getting the insurance companies and their lawyers and their political hacks out between the doctor and the patient would be a good thing for sure. You know, <laughs> It, it's just a win-win for everybody because, you know, the, the corporation could then take health care out of their equation for profits. My okay? guy, you just Go. said, Jack, let me stop you there. Let me stop you there, Jack. You just said the magic thing. And I don't, I mean, that is very profound. I, the thing about it is this, folks, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt Jack, but I want to, I, I, want, I need to piggyback onto what he said. Corporations do all kinds of things. They're research corporations. They're corporations that clean, clean homes, paint buildings, build streets, all of that. Why are we relegating healthcare on individuals for those guys to cover? I understand that unions had something to do with, with that many decades ago because they had no other recourse. But in a humane society, why companies should do what companies do best? And healthcare should be something that we, the people, provide. We, the people, right? And the, the the companies could work that much more efficient. And by the way, by the way, this is important. It is a mathematical impossibility for private health insurance companies to be more efficient than, as Jack would say, a single payer 
system which does not have the overhead of multiple administrators, multiple presidents, multiple CEOs, multiple databases, multiple uh, advertising agencies, mo- a, a doctor's office that has to have staff to cover all the different insurance companies they work with to figure out what is covered from insurance A to insurance B, etc. The inefficiency of a private insurance market is astounding, but it is also profitable for a few. Within that, within that inefficiency, that inefficiency is money in the bank for a few people. And we have as a and and that's what we do here at KPFT at Politics Done Right is try to get away from the lies that you hear on TV every day when you see the drugs advertised, when you see the insurance companies advertised, when you see all of that, folks. When you see those drug commercials, they are lying to you. When you see the healthcare commercials, they are lying to you. The biggest lie on TV right now is every 15 minutes, you see a a, a commercial that says the following. Hey, honey, you only have, and and the way it's designed, it's, it's, it's perfect to fool you. Hey, honey, we only have parts A and parts B of Medicare. Do you know? You should also get part C, which includes part A and part B. And guess what? It covers dental. And guess what? It covers hearing. And guess what? It covers vision. And everybody says, oh, we need to leave the Medicare just part A and part B. And we now get part C, which is also called Medicare Advantage. Honey, isn't that what we need to do? I'm going to go make the phone call right now. What they don't tell you is part C is private health insurance. Part C is private health insurance, also known as Medicare Advantage. And yes, you get. Eye care, nose care, all this good care that some care that you have to pay for, get a rider on standard Medicare. Yes, that's true. It seems to be less expensive. But at that point, you have just enslaved yourself to a company that's going to tell you which doctor you can go see. It's not government telling you which doctor you can see. It's Medicare Part C, which is a lie. It is actually Medicare Advantage provided by a private company. And with that, they control what medicines you get. And that medicine that you saw Paul Fleming getting, if they decide, you know what, your MS isn't bad enough to get that medication, we got to wait till you're close to death to give it to you. That's what Part C is going to do for you. They run your life at that point when you have Medicare A and B. By the way, Kettering Institute and all these other guys that cover, if you get some sort of bad cancer, et cetera, that covers it. Not Medicare Part C, brother. So what I'm trying to tell folks, is we have a system that lies to us all. The the healthcare system, the health insurance, they lie to you day in and day out. Day in and day out. They fool you into doing something that is not best for you. And then they're allowed to do it over the air. That is what drives me the most crazy. These waves belong to us all. And they're allowed to lie to you about And you know, and they get protagonists. I see one on TV now with a very well-respected guy who gave the news here in Houston. He was a very well-respected guy. And they tapped on his respectability to convince you to do something that ultimately costs you maybe less in the beginning, but will cost you either more later on or your life. But he's advertising it. He's out there telling you, go get part C. And the goal, the entire, look, let me tell you about private insurance and old people. When I say old people, I'm talking people over uh, 62 years old or so, all right? There was a time the private health insurance wouldn't touch you or they would charge you three times what they charge regular folks for health insurance. Why? Because older people require a bit, If you know, as you age, sometimes you require more health care. I have a grandmother that never went to the doctor, but you know, uh, you understand what I'm saying. In the, on the in the aggregate, as you get older, you use more 
healthcare. So the insurance companies wanted nothing to do with you. But they found a new sucker. It's called the United States government that all of us pay for with our health and with our tax dollars. And since now you are going to be covered by Medicare, they made a deal with the government. Hey, government, just give us X amount of dollar per each person. That and we will give you at a fixed cost, we will take care of that. We'll take that person off your hand, government. And then they take it and they run with it and they, they, they charge the government more than it costs you and they pay less to support you. It's a racket and we have to understand that we can change it, but we have to put people in office. As, as, as Howard would say, we have to engage in our own government. We have to engage our government. We have to make sure they're doing what's right by us. We can make a difference, but we have to participate. We have to vote and we have to not believe the lies on TV or the lies from the politician. We have to know what we're doing. We must do it right. Anonymous, come on into the show. Thank you so kindly for calling. Come on in, sir. Good morning, good morning. Look, I am so happy to hear you talking about this because you are telling people the truth. And uh, I, like you, have been, but I've been concerned about it for a very long time. I'm a person who uh, was forced in, involuntarily retired from my nursing uh, because of things that happened in my life, uh, incident and car uh, vehicle vehicle crashes and stuff like that and uh, nobody held responsible blah 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 but God's been good basically my health has been good I am 82 years old uh, I had insurance uh, that I purchased when I was a very young person didn't know what kind of insurance I should have purchased I just purchased insurance United Healthcare blah <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, uh, those other people, same thing. Um, they used to be called uh, Connecticut General. They're now called Cigna. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, Social Security, unfortunately, I had to file for it early because I didn't get the health care that I was trying to get to get well and get back to work. So, in essence, I actually have been on Social Security for a time. I've watched things, and I, I I don't have any insurance right now. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I was in the midst of getting care for my eyes. I was interrupted by someone at the Social Security office. You know, and you're right. This man who advertised for these people, he was once a news reporter. Yes. Well, the, who, the people who he speak of, they don't take care of you. Unless you have good gobs of money, and they still may not. And um, nobody, yeah, they, they still may not do anything for you. They have people who are under their uh, banner, who some are very lazy people. You don't know where they got their health so called certificates from. They have gotten them online. You, you don't know. I've been discriminated against because I don't need a lot of medication. I'm losing my vision because of what happened to me out of a Social Security office. 8989 Lake at 16th Drive. I've been trying to clear it up myself for the past seven years. I've not been able to see a doctor since. 2019, mid 2019. Let me tell you, uh, let me tell you, it's not at all. On- keep talking about Medicare Advantage. It's a disadvantage. It's they've exactly. Been to take away, so they've been trying to ruin, uh, uh, remove Medicare, get rid of it for years. And there are people holding office who've been in office for years, who've been helping them do this. And they got an R behind their name. And, thank uh, you. Anonymous. Yeah. Anonymous. Yeah. Thank you for 
thank thank you for telling the truth because again and I, I'm, 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 I hope they pay attention. I, I, you know, that's our job, uh, Anonymous. That is our job. And I, I, <laughs> I never drop anything. So I, I always stick with the program. So thank you so, thank you so, thank you so kindly. Thank you. Thank you and love you too. You. I will. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. You have a wonderful day. And thank you so kindly for listening. And remember, you keep talking as well, Anonymous. You keep telling the story to your friends. Also, by the way, do tell them that you are listening to a station where we get real information placed out there. Uh, very, very, very important. Anyhow, um, uh, you know, I have a video that I wanted to play, but with 10 minutes or eight minutes or so left on the program, I don't quite have enough time. So I'm going to continue. You can give us a call 713-526-5738, extension number two. I would love to hear from you. 713, your thoughts. You have a medical story. And by the way, let me tell you what else I'm doing, because I think healthcare is something that affects everybody, no matter who you are. Some folks will remain perfectly healthy for a very long time. And that is great. I honor you. But if you have stories, one of the ways that, and I, I told, I told uh, Paul this a few ago, one of the ways that uh, we get things done, right, is to, uh, is to go ahead and tell people's stories. Let people hear the things that can happen to them. I think that is so important. Uh, so if you have a story to tell, if you want to tell your story, give uh, either give me a call, 713-526-5738, extension number two, or if you want to set up a, a, an interview where we go through your story in detail, drop me a line at kpft at politicsdoneright.com, kpft at politicsdoneright.com. Because when we speak in the abstract, a lot of times I can come and tell you how insurance work and why it doesn't work and how it is pilfering us all. And I can tell you all of that. And you can look at it as this guy's throwing facts and numbers at me. Sometimes it can be overwhelming. But when we turn those facts into real life story, when you hear a Paul Fleming who had to pay $15,000 out of pocket to stay alive, and $600 a month for just that medication, not speaking about all his other expenses, that is real. Uh, the young woman who just called and talked about not being able to see a doctor since 2019. Since 2019. And I know exactly what's happening with, with her. They figure this is an older woman and we can just keep putting her off, putting her off, putting her off. And just maybe... Eventually, she will be off of our hands, right? This is an evil system. You know, there, there's, a, there's a congressman that I interviewed a few, uh, a few years ago. And this congressman used to have this statement that he always makes. He always made this statement that say, call, he called it the Republican health care plan. And you know what it is? If you get sick, no, the, the, the Republican health care plan is don't get sick. But if you get sick, die quickly. But the, the, my, he, he's, I think he's a bit unfair, though, because it's not just the Republican plan. It is a Republican plan aided by the... Uh, I don't want to call them blue dog Democrats. I'll, I'll call them more. Uh, 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 what kind of Democrats will we call those? Corporate Democrats. It's not just a Republican thing. The person who killed the public option to the Affordable Care Act wasn't a Republican. It was a Democrat. Lieberman. My point here is the following. Health care. Yes, one, one particular party will want to give you more health care. But the health care that we must have, the health care that saves lives, the health care that is really humane and honorable, the only form is one in which 
you're not giving your money away to a bunch of rich, fat cats and shareholders off of your premiums. And that one form of health insurance is a single payer Medicare for all, I don't, or healthcare for all, which we don't, we don't even need to use the word Medicare for all because people already have certain connotations about Medicare, but healthcare for all. All of us are entitled to life. We're entitled to good healthcare. We're entitled to these things and we ought to fight for it. We don't have to live this way. I know that, like I said, the problem, the, the problem is for 90% of Americans, their health, there are probably no serious health issues at any given time. I'm talking at any given time. But healthcare affects all of us over a period of time. Why not be ready for it? We need to support healthcare for all, and we need to make sure that Medicare Advantage ceases to exist. Because it is nothing more than uh, private health care at a high cost for old people. And I'm, I'm even calling myself old folk, okay? We have to do this right. I'm going to throw this back just for a few last commentaries for Brother Howard and, and Brother Jack out there in the studio. I was just asking uh, Brother Jack here, what is a blue dog Democrat? I don't think I've ever heard that term. A blue dog Democrat is a what I normally call a moderate Republican. Oh, okay. I, I just had not heard of it. Yeah. You know, uh, going back to the topics, you know, these ads that they run, you have to look at them like they're a seduction. They're a seduction to try to get you to go to the doctor Ooh. and say something. I like that. Uh, you know, the total cost of taking care of the people would probably be less than trying to deny claims and all the, all the trouble they have to go through. And I think that this is a corporate responsibility that they need to take on. Well, uh, take Jack, I, yeah, I, Jack, I, what, I, what I really want is I want it confoundedly out of the corporate domain. Because, the, 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 like I mentioned, and I, we have to wrap up here, but I just want one quick statement. Those executives, it's not that these executives are bad. They're doing their job. Their job is to look out for the fiduciary. Their, their fiduciary responsibility is not to the client. It is to the shareholders. Uh, I'm, uh, Friedman said it. The, the god of, of our capitalism said it. So we can't blame the executives. That's what they've learned. What we have to do is change the system. And we can and we have the power following Howard's rule, which is folks get out there and vote. We are up on time now. My name is Egberto Willis. I thank you so kindly for your ears. Folks, call in some more. You you know, if you have something to say, I want to hear from you. My name is Egberto Willis. I want to thank Howard and Jack in the studio. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics and Right. And you guys know how I end this. Baby, I am what? Out. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.